Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 31st episode of By the Bywater. We are very glad uh, to be back and we're glad you're with us. As always, thank you so much. Um, wow, uh, yeah, September, it happened, I guess is the best way to put it. So, uh, But but uh, Oriana was on a, on a trip, on a voyage, on a honeymoon even, yes? Yeah, a real long 11-day honeymoon. And we went to the Redwoods and it was just so magical, Yay. you guys. It's. I get it now. Like you know, the sequoias were great, but like, wow, wow. Just the coastal redwoods alone. Yeah, uh, we went on this hike that you know take go. You go from the deep redwood rainforest to the sea and back, and mm. you know that's that's nice. I recommend that if you can do that. You've you've now fully become part of the West Coast, which Jared and I, you know, can speak about with authority yeah, here. You know, yes. my whole life. So, yeah. <laughs> so you just get lost in Oregon woods sometimes, or don't, depending if you don't want to get too lost. But it's, it's yeah, get, it's, get, 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 be a little careful, especially if you're in like Southern Oregon. <laughs> Stick near the highways or the or the or the train track. <laughs> so at least there's something going on. I will say that the train route. From uh, from San Francisco up to Portland goes down through a part of the Willamette Valley that is nowhere near any of the freeways, and that part alone is like. Uh. Mm. But you know we are not a touristy blog. Tempting though it is, though gets you close to nature if you're going past it at like you know 50 miles an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> think of it that way. But uh, anyway, we are all in one piece. We've got some stuff to talk about. We've even got a little bit of news, and so we might as well just move right into that. So Jared, as always, please do take it away. <laughs> The big news is, of course, the new Tolkien book, but that's the rest of this episode. So, you know, we'll get to that later. Uh, (laughs) But in terms of the Amazon series, after last month finally giving us some information, there's nothing particularly new to note except for one interesting detail. There have been a couple of reports from Deadline and other sources indicating that Howard Shore, who, of course, famously did the music for all the feature films, has been in talks to work on the music for the series. Again, while the Amazon series and the Jackson films are fully separate projects, this would be an amazing amazing instance of connective tissue on par with, you know, John Howe's involvement with the design. Further reports indicate that this may be a case where Shore helps develop key themes, but the detailed soundtrack work could be done by someone else with the suggestion that Barry McCreary, who worked on the Battlestar Galactica reboot, Outlander, Walking Dead, and the new Foundation series, will be doing just that. You know, no official announcement, of course, about any of this yet, so we'll just have to wait and see. As usual. <laughs> As ever. The, uh, we'll just wait and see. <laughs> the one thing I saw alleged that uh, that Shore has definitely signed on, but it's the exact question of capacity, and, you know, McCreary query may be as much you know understandable rumor as anyone else since Wishful he's such, thinking. yeah <laughs> such a genre guy yeah but it could be you know could easily be someone else or who knows how this will work out if this is even happening you know this could be this could be silly season filling in the gossip things now that we're just mm. trying to figure out what happens next since the filming's clearly done now we got to work on the post stuff so <laughs> we will have to see um if it does happen though that would be you know interesting i mean you know there's there, there's very few themes that would necessarily happen to connect and carry over. Um, mm. So there's room for at least some original development, no matter who does it. Um, you know, is, does Galadriel have a specific theme? It feels more like textures with her. I mean, there's like yeah. the Lothlorien theme, that, but that yeah. doesn't tie to her specifically. Right, yeah. And, you know, we've got we've got various evil Sauron themes and things like that, of course. So, you know, but, uh, you know, he, at that point, he's not quite there yet, so he's taking on yeah. another form. So, they play it in a major key on yeah. a friendly instrument. <laughs> yeah. But I... The- I would I would like to because we were kind of deprived of Howard Shore creating full new themes for the Hobbit. It felt mm. like mm. Uh, mm. The, he simply did not have enough time. I think that was that was kind of the major issue there. Uh, so hopefully, if this is happening, he does have the time to create some new wonderful Middle Earth sounds for us. Didn't they also? This is maybe more like gossipy or anything, but didn't they sort of mess with his? actual soundtrack 
with the with the music composed for the Hobbit, where they like yes. j- rejiggered it, so there's <laughs> yes. like the Ring Wraith theme playing, yep. where Ring Wraiths aren't involved and all that where kind of thing. It's Thorin, yeah, having a triumphant moment. Don't remind uh, me. It's like you can't you can't treat his work as though it's like a, a library that you can pull from. I wonder if that was like supposed to be just a temp thing. They were like, just grab something from the library, like stick <laughs> and it they in there. To change it, the edit. And I love. <laughs> and then, like, they just, I don't, like, you know, they genuinely just ran out of time and money and were like, well, this is happening now. <laughs> this is what it is. We don't really, we can't change it at this point. It's just too, too intensive uh, to change. Yeah. Hopefully they won't be doing that with him this time around, although that would be perversely funny. <laughs> the, oh the, the eternal ringway theme. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think not. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> I mean, if it does, they could, we don't know. We don't know what the story is yet. It could involve the fall of some Numenorians. Used in the so- right setting, used in the right context, not like, you know, I don't know, you know, proto hobbits appearing and all of a sudden that player's Oh my god. So, you know, there's a really angry hobbit and <laughs> the one. That's a good name for a yeah, that's a good name for a pub or something, the angry hobbit. I'm supposed to have done that already. Oh my god, that's a great little display name for Twitter too. <laughs> the angry hobbit. I think I'm gonna steal that. I have a list of of Twitter display names. I'm gonna add that. <laughs> Please, by all means. <laughs> Oh, dear. All right. Well, we will see what further news comes out. Again, we're not expecting much uh, for probably for a little more few months here, especially as Amazon's big focus, of course, going to be on uh, the Wheel of Time series coming out. And uh, there's been doing with that. The end of the year is going to be full with all sorts of, shall we say, non-Tolkien things that a few of us will be paying attention to and things like that. So uh, if you're going to be watching that, you know, join us, even though we won't be really talking about it here. Um, I will say, however, in terms of other genre stuff, you might want to check out Star Wars Visions, the new uh, Japanese uh, anime anthology series that's on Disney Plus, uh, because one of the episodes, specifically the Ninth Jedi, is uh, is done by uh, the director is uh, Kenji Kamiyama, who is of course doing the Roar of the Rohirrim uh, anime film uh, for Warner Brothers. That's set in continuity with the Jackson films uh, that'll be coming out in a couple of years. We've spoken about that before. There's also a very handy little behind the scenes thing uh, that also includes a discussion of the composer that he most regularly works with and. And what she was doing. So it's sort of like, oh, well, this might be a sneak peek into what happens here in a couple of years. Um, I thought it was a really good entry, so just throwing that out there. So, But we are not a Star Wars podcast, <laughs> so I will stop there. So that's just well, a little... Also, um, just to tack on to news that's not Tolkien-related, um, I should have mentioned this last episode and forgot, but I have illustrated a book that is out now. Woo! Yay! Yeah, it is a a horror novel about a serial killer killing gay men in Toronto. (laughs) It is very good, if that is a thing you (laughs) are interested in. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's out there. It's very good. You know, there's just like a few little drawings in it that I did, but... um, yeah, pick that up wherever fine books are sold. So, That's uh, so I should mention the name uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Red uh, X by David Demchuk. <laughs> okay, and uh, I, I've certainly heard about the case that uh, that uh, that uh, it, it's it's based on. Now, is it fiction or nonfiction? I'm sorry. Um, so it's it's actually an interesting sort of blend between the two. Um, most mm. of it is fiction, but it is interspersed with sort of personal essays. I know it may sound kind of boring, but um, it's it's almost like um, he's jur- journaling his way through the trauma. So mm-hmm. it is like those are facts, but they also feed, they loop back into the fictional horror, which is not any less scary than the reality of that case. So mm-hmm. True enough. Yeah. So we will have links to that in the show notes. Yes, sorry, we should have talked about that right at the top of the episode. We're sorry we let that. Oh, I should have mentioned it last time. It's been out for over a month. Like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some personal news. Some yes. personal news. Yes, that counts. That counts. So, and there may be more from some of us with some time to come, but uh, that we'll we'll see about that. But all of us have projects on the boil. Let's put it that way. We're we're doing all, we're doing all sorts of things. So, uh, but in any event, uh, it is time to move on to the episode proper, and that means or our main topic, I should say, and uh, that is choices come back around to me, and so I will begin. 
The apparently fixed final canon exploring Tolkien's unpublished Middle-earth writing before his death appeared to have reached an end with Christopher Tolkien's History of Middle-earth series, with his later volumes being collations or edited presentations from that bulk of stories. So it was a pleasant surprise, but still definitely a surprise, when the word came out last year about a new collection of further unpublished work following Christopher's passing in January 2020. But per the introduction to the volume, The Nature of Middle-Earth, this book had been thoroughly approved by Christopher as a new project to work on. And a project it is, because if there is one thing it is absolutely not, it is a cohesive new set of stories. Anything but. The origins of The Nature of Middle-Earth can be found in what amateur but still serious Tolkien fandom had evolved into by the 1980s. Several self-published journals had taken increasingly extensive looks into more foundational elements of Tolkien's work, specifically in terms of language, Tolkien's original childhood interests that shaped both his professional and creative work throughout his life. One of the most notable was Vinyar Tengwar, begun in 1988, one of two publications, along with Parma Elda Lamberon, created under the auspices of the Elvish Linguistic Fellowship, ELF for short, but of course, <laughs> itself affiliated with the larger Mythopoeic Society, the now decades-old American-based fan scholar group dedicated to the work of the Inklings as a whole, including C.S. Lewis and Charles Williams. So, throwing my hat into the ring, I can speak to a lot of this origin directly thanks to my own then pretty active participation in Tolkien fan circles, thanks in part to my getting to know a fellow San Diego area fan, Jorge Quinones, who which led to my attending what might have been the first in-person meeting of the ELF. I really can't be sure, it's been too long, as well as two, the two of us collaborating on my one published article for Finyar Tengwar on astronomy in Middle Earth. Here's where I also freely note that that work has long since been superseded by the work of Christine Larson, so do by all means check her various articles out about Tolkien and astronomy. We'll put some links in the show notes. I further bring this up, though, because Vinyar Tengwar and its editor, Carl Hostetter, who I had a chance to meet at events like the Tolkien Centenary Conference in 1992, rapidly became one of Christopher Tolkien's trusted outlets for sharing more esoteric selections from Tolkien's otherwise unpublished work. This was important, because while the History of Middle Earth series seemed on the face of it exhaustive, when Christopher began presenting what turned out to be its final three volumes, covering Tolkien's post-Lord of the Rings work on Middle Earth, besides numerous stories or reworked tales, he also shared a variety of texts that delved more deeply into radical rethinking of his mythology's overall scope, plus various more philosophical, almost near-theological texts and arguments. But Christopher added further that there were even more such texts, often bound up with deeper linguistic explorations or considerations, that weren't included in those volumes. The nature of Middle Earth, in essence, is meant to be the definitive presentation of these scattered texts, as well as further descriptive materials and notes ranging from geography to biology to further detail on material published in both the History of Middle Earth series and in the earlier Unfinished Tales collection. In his introduction to the book, Hostetter details how Christopher Tolkien initially entrusted him with copies of a variety of material from this collection of texts, and how initial selections from it, published in Vineyard Tengwar and elsewhere, led to more sharing of material, and eventually Hostetter's book proposal to present as much of it as possible in one volume, something which, as noted, received Christopher's approval. It is not truly exhaustive, as Hostetter notes at various points throughout the text, where some reproduced articles or pieces excise the linguistic discussion more appropriate for the dedicated audiences of publications like Vinyar Tengwar. But what's left is a lot. A lot. <laughs> Our discussion today is going to be more free-floating than it has ever been, frankly, because there's no through line in this volume in any sense of the word beyond Hostetter's general organization. And it does have to be said he's done a fine job in both such organization and editing what's available. But we can say that there's been a lot to chew over, and we've been pondering a lot of this quite a bit over the past month via Slack discussion. If there's a major element, though, it would be Tolkien's deeper exploration into what the elves actually were as a species, a civilization, an innate form of being. Everything from childhood games for learning counting and indeed what exactly the nature of childhood was and is for elves, to the meaning of death in Middle-earth for elves and what the fate of their souls was within those bounds is up for discussion. Not to mention, frankly, more math than any of us would ever have guessed, but we'll get into that, trust us. (laughs) If there's kind of a takeaway to be had from finishing the book, though, it's the further confirmation that whatever else he was doing in terms of other work, and it's worth remembering in these years that Tolkien was moving towards his retirement from academics, plus dealing with his increasing popularity, leading to a mid-60s publication explosion and the day-to-days of life, 
It's that Middle Earth up to 50 years and after from its original conception remains something Tolkien would elaborate on, interrogate, rework, add to, and otherwise flesh out, from detailed essays to quick summaries and scraps of thought captured as it occurred to him. That there could be yet even more such material isn't surprising, and as with so much of what he talks about as collected and published in other volumes, sometimes even the slightest mentions make you wish he had taken the time to write so much more about one subject or another. But at least we have this, and now we all have this to keep in mind with his other work, and so it's time to move into wider discussion and open up the floor. Oh my goodness, there's so much in this book. Oh Where, God, to begin? Where to begin? Where to begin? I mean, there's the small stuff, there's the big stuff. Um, but yeah, learning about Elvish childhood game, counting games, is like, w- w- what What a detail. What a random little detail. Yeah. Of course he would do that. Why wouldn't he do that? <laughs> that is something, though, that uh, speaks to Tolkien's you know, huge identity as, as a, as a father, you know, Mm -hmm. like I, it would not occur to me. I don't think as a childless person to, to go on this whole long tangent and bother creating this kind of these finger games to teach Elvish children, the names of numbers and fingers and, and that kind of thing. That is that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he would, you know, tie it into tie it into both language and also just sort of again larger questions of what elves are and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, but maybe before we get into like you know uh, piecing together the minutiae, I was sort of presenting kind of my read on the book as a as a collection. Uh, what did you think about it? I don't think any of us ch- could read it through straight through. It's like you have to read a few pages and put it down and go like, what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to skip. I mean, I don't think any of us are really math people, but I ended up skipping. It's like a third of the yeah. book. I swear. It's just all these, <laughs> these tables of like, you know, at this point in time, the elves have this, you know, population. And then by this year, but like not a real year, but like a valiant year or whatever, they're, they number this much. And it's just like, I'm, I'm happy he did all this for his own. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. I, I don't need to see, I don't need to see his work here I'm not his math teacher you know I don't <laughs> So I ended up skipping all that. The rest of it was fascinating, but I was just my my first impression because that's front loaded. That math stuff was right mm-hmm. there at the front. Mm-hmm. Right. I was had this moment of just discouragement, going, "Oh no, is this what the <laughs> whole book is going to be?" <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's definitely worth reading. And there's, I'm sure there's stuff buried in there that I will regret missing. But at the same time, there was so much math. <laughs> I mean, uh, Carl Hostetter said as much at one point, something like he says, uh, un, uh, an, an unknown, uh, uh, the unknown facility a Tolkien had for math <laughs> for to be able to just dedication because he was writing this out. You know, this is well before personal calculators and things like this. You know, he yeah. actually had to sit down and calculate all this out. And it's sort of like, oh, good on you, dude. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> if it makes you happy, do it. <laughs> I mean, it reminds me, and it reminds – here's what it reminds me of, and this is possibly apocryphal, um, but I seem to remember reading it at one point. It's that uh, it reminded me of nobody so much as a story I've heard about Isaac Newton in this sense. Obviously, he was a mathematician. Duh. However, um, what uh, – besides his you know, legendarily groundbreaking, you know, um, modern foundation of physics and mathematics, et cetera, everything he did, he was also very theologically interested. Hey, keep your interest. But he apparently spent a lot of his time – like on these incredibly esoteric and in the end utterly irrelevant, you know, calculations and things like, you know, angels, things like that. It's sort of like, on the one hand, it clearly kept him happy, very happy. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you know, we all have our interests. Not everything lasts what we do. Totally understood. At the same time, you just sort of go from the vantage point of history going like, that's nice, but why didn't you focus on the stuff that you know <laughs> that you really that you really did did the best with there? And <laughs> there's a feeling of that when you read all this and you think about things like you know the unfinished rewrite of the Gondolin story uh, mm-hmm. to refer to our last episode and just things like that. It's like, oh, you spent so much time. That's great, but. <laughs> I think we are all victims of that exact behavior mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. how many times to- i know i have done this and i know you guys have done it too <laughs> where you know i will have this like like a revision of a pilot script or something and like i know i need to do it there's i have some ideas that i want to integrate and some scenes i want to rewrite and some shuffling around and i know i can see it i can see how it'll work it won't even be that difficult but what do i do instead what do i do instead i look on i go on twitter 
I go on Twitter and send off little stupid tweets too often. And I think, I think this math thing was Twitter's or was Tolkien's Twitter. Like, I think that was his, like, I should be doing this other thing. I can't, I can, but like, you know, the elf, you know, the Valley in year and how it relates to our sun year. I mean, I gotta do, I gotta do that instead. Yeah. Well, it's, that reminds me a lot of, I've mentioned, I think, in earlier episodes, this this massive and, frankly, kind of absurd science fiction project. I started when I was, like, 16, and I was like, this is the best thing ever, and then let it go for a few years, and then revisited it just to see what, like, what am I still, what am I doing? Um, and I still find myself, when I'm working on this thing, that, you know, it may never see the light of day, but it makes me happy to work on it. Mm-hmm. There's, like, the main narrative, but then if I refer to, if I make some sort of weird background reference, and then I find myself stuck in the actual writing, I will go back and be oh, okay, so what is this background reference? If I'm going to refer to this thing, I should know what it means, and then I can refer to it again in a different light. So I I will write out this whole legendary history of this one thing just in case I need it. Um, And I was doing that before I read this book. Um, So whatever, I guess that's just the thing people do. So it kind of, it reminds me of that where he's like, if he's going to talk about something, it doesn't matter if the audience ever knows what he's talking about, but you should be able to sense the shape of it Mm -hmm. from later. But what makes that more complicated here is that I think a lot, not a lot of this, but, a significant chunk of it, at least, is post Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's, it's not that anymore. It is something else mm-hmm. where he's just doing, he's tinkering, doing the map. Yeah, tinkering. And it's so, that reminds me of something that I wanted to talk about, even if it's just briefly, is the way that he keeps complicating the published work mm-hmm. by saying things like Legolas was wrong about the Lothlorien elves habitually living in trees. Like, they do it, but they don't want to. And Legolas misunderstood that, repeated it to the Fellowship as fact, then Frodo writes it down, you know, years later. And it's, it just, we already knew the book was more or less unreliable because, you know, it's an eyewitness account written by hobbits who don't necessarily understand everything they're talking about and all that. But then you go and, like, undermine the authority of the authorities within the text. Right. <laughs> and again, nobody ever sees and this. For what? And, yeah, and for, for what? what? For just, what? I, I, I just find that fascinating that he was, he almost didn't seem able to, in some, sometimes seem able to recognize the difference between this and reality. So he would be like, like, this is wrong. Or the way he constantly refers to sages of Gondor or yeah. whatever that he gives a name and he's like as so and so writes and it's like dude this is basically just your journal you don't need to pretend for anybody that this is real it's endlessly fascinating to me that he's doing this when nobody will see it that, or yeah. you know he assumed nobody would maybe putting those veils between him and the work mm-hmm. like we talked a bit about that in the slack and how mm. it it on the one hand it does add a lot of richness to the world Mm -hmm. where to have that like, Oh yeah. You know, the Gondor, the Gondorian scholars would have a different, uh, sort of read on, on these events Mm -hmm. and the Elvish, you know, even, even the elves aren't all in agreement on, on what, on their own history and their own metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, there is that, that does impart a lot of richness, but like you said, Jared, at some point, no, you're not, no one's going to read this. <laughs> like no one, no, like it's just, uh, uh, it's the, it's the, it's the no face and spirited away offering the gold <laughs> to say, uh, uh. Yeah. it's like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, he had to have known at a certain point that people would be going through his papers because he knew like famously said, you know, being a cult figure in one's own lifetime is not at all pleasant all that. He had to have known that this would be happening. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to be the purpose of any of this. The, no. Each of the sections, I, I do love this, each of the sections has a little description at the beginning, like, written on, like, the back of an invoice or whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. In really illegible <laughs> fountain pen. <laughs> <laughs> Just all this, some of it is incredibly important, and it's written on the back of a receipt, and it's yeah. almost illegible and all that. So I don't, I really don't think that he was putting some of this together for those who come after some of it may have been, but a lot of it is just so obscure and so on its own, like as a physical document, illegible that Mm -hmm. like, what are you, Mm -hmm. what are you doing this for? Are you just doing this because this is just your inner life? Yeah. At this point, this is all that's going on inside you. I don't Mm -hmm. know. I don't know. I'm just wondering is 
or is that just such a huge chunk of his inner life? Really, not not all of that, because obviously he had his children and everything. But yeah, it it does. Yeah, I mean, it occurs to me now that, especially now you phrase it that way, that uh, reading at least some of this material might be best. Um, sort of read in combination with the still slightly obscure work that he did, um, but that is published as part of the History of Middle Earth series, and those are the Notion Club papers, uh, yeah. which uh, which uh, really go into uh, the uh, sort of uh, through his through a sort of a fictional setting of a of an Oxford academic club essentially as a framework. Really goes into the idea of like, what am I doing here? What am I creating? And what have I done? Uh, for lack of a better term, I believe this is all uh, included in the Sauron Defeated volume. If I'm wrong, it's in one of the other volumes there. And that was post- Lord of the Rings as well, and I think it's as close as Tolkien may have ever gotten to, I, I could well be wrong, from a, an extended perspective over what am I doing here is the best way to do it, <laughs> and how did I do it, and how how's it done? Now, I need to go back and reread that, and again, it needs to be something that sort of maybe is best within the context of these later papers and later work in general. But um, as as the introduction itself indicates uh, by uh, by Carl Hostetter, um, the timing of all this material from 57 and 67, for the most part, um, ties in with all those last those last three History of Middle-Earth books where Tolkien really was going through a severe, I don't want to call it a crisis, but a severe sort of sense of, wait, what have I got? Have I been doing this wrong the whole time? Mm-hmm. Have I been considering yeah. it wrong? And and a big chunk of it has to do with the fact that it's not totally spelled out in here, but at least mentioned more than once or twice. It is very much more spelled out in the appropriate History of Middle-Earth books that Tolkien was looking at the argument going like, wait, the elves are essentially these hyperhuman people who can see and understand everything and all the rest of it. They know the reality of the world they're in. They they know a mythology would not work, essentially is what it is. And it's this... It's something I've always found fascinating because Tolkien is willing to blow up his mythology for England concept at a certain point and substitute it with the idea that he's still creating this mythology, but a mythology dealing with the world as it actually exists, that uh, the sun and the moon were always around, that the moon is a lifeless yeah. vo- blob in the sky and things like this. It's it's heavy going, and he never could square the circle. And when you read uh, those books and this in combat with it, you really get a sense of him going like, I created this fascinating tale, but it's not reality. What do I do? Of course, the problem here from my, I, I call it a problem, from my perspective, <laughs> my body is like, yeah. you created a good story. Live with the story, my yeah. friend. You're fine. Just live with the story. Mm-hmm. But we're not the creators. <laughs> we're, we're not right. him. We can't say that. And for him, this question of creation and sub-creation and how that was actually you know, delved pretty pretty deep, I would say, um, to stop there for the moment. So Yeah, I mean, it felt like he had his own inner ethical considerations here, because yeah. as we know, he was a very, as they say, a staunch Catholic. Sub-creation, for him, I think, could only go so far. Mm-hmm. Like, it has to be the real world, in a mm-hmm. sense, even if you're fictionalizing it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm maybe putting words in his mouth here, but it seemed like he was willing in his youth. He was willing to go beyond certain bounds and be like, yeah, the earth was flat and then it was round. And then the sun and the moon are a a flower and a fruit and all that. And then as he got older, was like, yeah, that's not, you know, that's not God didn't make the world with make it flat. He would have made it round and all of that. So and then he's like, well, okay, so I've done I've I've messed up a little bit with my imagination. Now mm-hmm. I have to rein it back in. And I, I think that's, it's a little, to me, it's a little silly in a way, but I also mm-hmm. think it's kind of admirable that he was like, I do have these ethical qualms. They may be silly ethical qualms, but they're mine mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's my work. So I've got to, I've got to bring it back in line with what I think is right. You know, even if it is an inherently, again, kind of silly undertaking, it's, he was sticking to his guns. And honestly, props for him not being one of those weird flat earth Catholics. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> what, flat earth Catholics? Did I miss something? Yeah, it's like... Are they around it, now? <laughs> people who, like, of course, very, very uh, steadfastly reject Vatican II <laughs> and, <laughs> like, call uh, our current... A geocentric or heliocentric Heliocentric. model, modern day sun worship, Mm. and just oh, it's 
wild stuff. So I, that is kind of it is kind of encouraging to see that he wasn't one of those guys. Well, um, folks, if you could see the look on my face, I, it's <laughs> Jared pretty great. And I kind of want to take a screenshot. <laughs> I, I, I got nothing. <laughs> well, he and C.S. Lewis, which is also kind of surprising in a way, were both like. <clears throat> into science they both refer to like evolution as a fact and Mm -hmm. that kind of thing and in the in the nature of middle earth tolkien does go into this is how evolution could still happen within this mythological framework let's think Mm -hmm. about the patterns and all of that which Mm -hmm. is a whole topic we could get into but oh yeah uh, yeah we're gonna um i didn't read about neoplatonism for nothing (laughs) well we should get into it so do you want to do you want to do you want to lead us down that primrose fast because the whole idea of just reincarnation and death and uh, in 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 elven terms that those were the heaviest going parts for me those are the ones are like man i'm just going to read the words and i'm not going to fully digest them because this is getting esoteric as hell yep <laughs> yeah um well it is it, yeah we just finished this whatever thought i was trying to stumble towards <laughs> fair, um, fair. <laughs> that he like yeah staunch catholic etc but he was still combining that with rationality and like well this is what the evidence says and all of mm-hmm. that so it was you know he's got this whole mythology that he is then trying to not just include the sun and moon as having always been there and all that but still be like well we you know science suggests evolution really was a thing and you know six day creation wasn't a thing so like so using the patterns and all that yeah. I don't, what is the word he uses for them anyway to suggest like by the combination of various things over time and all of that then you know you still have life arising in this way it's just got this um not even a veneer of mythology but like the source of evolution is mythology and metaphysics of middle earth that he is constructing which i think is really interesting again like you know staunch catholic flat earth whatever they all this there, you know every religion has its fringe movements and certainly catholicism is, uh, anyway um i had to pull up grab the book and look at it because the the stuff about patterns is if you're reading along at home 256 has discussions of the great pattern and all that mm-hmm. but i have to preface this by saying i did take a, a class in ancient philosophy in college and it was like just the greeks because you know why would we learn about anything else yeah it's just, <laughs> just the greeks yeah, the only ones philosophy. anyway got through all the weird ones like heraclitus and anaximander and all that and then got to plato and i was like okay this sucks and i hate it <laughs> but for you <laughs> i went back <laughs> to read some plato again and Oh, I don't, I couldn't even, full disclosure, I could barely even follow all the discussion of patterns in here because I was just like, this is, this is that college class all over again. I can't, I don't get it. A pattern is, I mean, it's kind of what it sounds like, right? Like it's, this is, it's the, the ideal form of something. Like there is a, so to speak, a pattern of redness or there is a pattern to which a tree will conform in order to be understood as a tree. Take everything I'm saying with a giant grain of salt, because again, I barely understood it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it now. Uh, or there's like a pattern of dogness and uh, anything, anything that you perceive is sort of partaking in this form. Plato calls them forms. Tolkien calls them patterns. It's basically the same thing. Mm-hmm. So like there's a, there's a, there's an ideal form or pattern of a table, but also if the table is square, then it's sort of intersecting. It's with the, with, um, you know, the form of squareness, or if, it, if it's black, then that is added into, and so every object is basically the new, the center of several Venn diagrams happening at once. And that's kind of what's happening here. And then the great pattern is, um, Plato didn't, I think, go this far. He used the analogy of the sun as like the good and the intellect and everything illuminating the, the phenomenal world. For Tolkien, I think that's God. And that's a very that's more neoplatonic because plato didn't do that plato was still not really a monotheist in neoplatonic thought which did end up kind of combining with early christianity like saint augustine was super into this kind of thing god is the ultimate source and illuminator of these forms and patterns and depending on the track you take he or it (laughs) they again it was neoplatonism was sort of it absorbed by several different traditions and christianity is just one of them so depending on which route you take i think the manichaeans maybe did some i don't i don't want to speak i don't want to speak foolishly about this Mm -hmm. um so anyway god is like either um creating these patterns um and may with greater or lesser degrees of will i believe be directing them to combine to produce the phenomenal world Mm -hmm. Um, which is a phrase I love, and I think I know what it means, but don't ask me to explain. <laughs> the world of phenomenon, the world where things right. happen, the right. world of matter and energy and sensation and all that. Yes, phenomenal world is such a great phrase. Anyway, so that's 
kind of what's happening here. It made my eyes cross trying to read it again. But <laughs> 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 so that and that that, that um, gets into the reincarnation thing, where like you know. Oof. You can't. Oh, yeah. So the, the, the spirit, the fea, remembers the pattern of the body that it had. I love this. Wild. Part, I love. I love. I love. It. That's great. That's great. It, well, it's easy to understand, too. You're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It has all of the knowledge yeah. of the building so, blocks of its own body. So there's a body. few different versions of reincarnation in here. Um, one is like they are literally reborn, like Glorfindel is literally reborn and then somehow gets back to Middle Earth. We don't know. Mm. Um, but there's <laughs> other ones like there's a dialogue between Manwe and Eru where Eru is like, look, the spirit remembers the body. All you have to do is sort of read that blueprint and put together a new body for it. And it's I just love your refusal to explain so that. Cool. that like, what what happens? Is it, are we talking Cronenbergian <laughs> horror in terms of putting together a new body? Is it just simply yeah, well, waiting think, a wand? I think what happens? <laughs> there's a there's a resurrection ship moored in El. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes. Galactica yeah. again. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um I think what he's what I read this as being is that even if, you know, the, the, the conscious mind the, of, the, of the Fea isn't necessarily aware of, like, the percentage of iron in the body or whatever, there is – it's still imprinted on the whatever matter the soul is made of. Mm. So you would just have to, as a Vala, probably Aule or somebody is doing this, um, like, scans <laughs> the blueprint that the soul has – the soul has been marked by the body, mm-hmm. and you just analyze – the little divots made by the atoms in it or something. I don't know. Um, and then from that, you just slap together and you just, you just, <laughs> you just do it literally like replicate, like star Trek replicate from molecules, <laughs> the body that the soul remembers, <laughs> which is bananas. But I love that. I like it so much more than they just get reborn as babies. I mean, and he gets into mm-hmm. that like ethically or morally yeah. that has issues. That has you problems. Have a literally yeah. old, an old soul and a young body. That's the whole thing. But, but, yeah, and also like he was like you know it's not fair to the parents having a child that is already. You're talking. Fully... This is like Dune abomination level stuff. Happening. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you're onto something there. <laughs> the streams are crossing. Yeah, just that. That I. This is. I mean, this is how I had canon Elvis reincarnation. Now is this sort of scanning and duplicating thing. What, however, it works because I think it's so weird. Especially for high fantasy. It's just... Yeah, that's the really weird thing. It's weird, but at the same time, as and this is something I think is a real good service of this book, is that Carl Oster includes a glossary at the end where he really delves mm-hmm. into explicit uh, discussions of Catholic theology in comparison, at some points, to other forms of uh, Christian theology, too, which I think is useful. Mm-hmm. And given where Tolkien's, you know, where his you know, allegiances lay, uh, connections, uh, connections uh, to on a, on a very explicit levels at points that are being drawn where he's essentially squaring certain magisterial, uh, and I'm using that word very intentionally, certain magisterial Catholic teachings on on mm. uh, on on deeper levels uh, with what he's coming up with. He's sort of rephrasing them for a Middle Earth bent. It's not a complete one to one by any means, but it's uh, but it's an interesting parallel, that's for sure. So uh, so yeah, no, it is a wild concept, but at the same time, bizarrely enough, it's actually not a new one. <laughs> so is I guess what it comes down to so yeah it's the specific it's not new but there are the specific sort of Tolkienian touches where the the valor the the valor the valar <laughs> the valar um, the valor. are still responsible for this sort of sub-creative act of making a new body mm-hmm. god's not going to mm-hmm. do it it's your job <laughs> yeah that's why you're there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, those discussions, yeah, the dialogues between Manway and Euro is like, boy, those office meetings. But more seriously, it is. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this could have been an email. Did, did we have to have a Zoom meeting? <laughs> 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 the, uh, the, uh, but, but yeah, getting, getting the sense of it, especially the sense of who's, who's recording this and how do we know? <laughs> you know, that's sort of things. It's sort of like, you know, the question of the free, the free floating narrator of Tolkien all over the place is a very interesting subject. That's for sure. It's sort of, you know, it expands and contracts in scope as need be. But yeah, it's that everything about the reincarnation, the death, the whole thing, that is, it, it's a lot to chew over. And part of me thinks the big reason, too, is that Tolkien is desperate to try and divide why are elves not like men? 
Mm-hmm. He's not explaining it for mm-hmm. men because he doesn't have to, in essence. And the whole idea is that men is like, you die and you go somewhere right. else. He's sort of like, yeah, that's that's us. You know, whereas yeah. the elves are more tied to this world and he has to sort of square them with the world. That's the thing. They come back because they are part of Arda. <laughs> they can't really leave Arda. You can't send mm-hmm. elves beyond the thing. And that also ties into something interesting, too, about how he's very insistent at more than one point that elves can't be evil at all ever mm-hmm. that <laughs> is so interesting yeah, yeah but they can individually they're they're unfallen so they can individually make mistakes but because they didn't have you know the original sin of disobedience right at the beginning mm. it's it's much more individual they aren't as a whole doomed yeah and yet as they are like in another part of one of those writings he does it's talking about like how men and elves like to eat oh, animals yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that being kind of a sign that they, you know, mm. the incarnates, and I think that word choice on his part is, is very deliberate. The incarnates, uh, m- live by death. And because of that, that shows us that they are part of Arda marred. There is no such mm-hmm. thing as Arda unmarred with yeah. incarnates present. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, and I find of, that fascinating. I think that's yeah, that does very deep. Bring up stuff that he gets into in Morgoth's ring, mm-hmm. which is, what is that, the last volume of the history of Middle-earth? Uh, no, the last one's Peoples of Middle-earth. Morgoth's ring is, I think, the it's pretty third late, last. It, it, it's, one of the, it's one of those three last ones, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, where he gets into um, Morgoth, I guess Melkor at that point, persists in Arda because he managed to corrupt everything that mm-hmm. was going on right yeah. from the beginning. So he, in essence, can't be killed because he is Arda. Arda is his ring. It's Morgoth's ring a lot. So um, yeah. elves being created of the matter of a flawed world mm-hmm. are themselves flawed, mm-hmm. but they aren't fallen. Right. Which is such a fine hair splitting distinction, especially when you go on to see elves do right. the worst stuff. <laughs> Horrible <laughs> to each other, to other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting. Like it's it's still for them a matter of almost like individual responsibility in a way. Personal, like you, like I mean, they they don't like Feanor didn't wake up and go, "I'm going to be evil today." He was led down this path through mm-hmm. multiple conflicting influences. They can still become evil in a sense. Mm-hmm. They can do evil, but they are not inherently sinful. I think yeah, I think that that sounds, yeah. that sounds yeah. Oh, yeah. right to me. I don't know, maybe maybe we're wrong, but I don't know. That Which, sounds yeah, right to me. A, I don't I don't even know where to go with that. It's mm-hmm. it, it well, it's just a very profound. It's it's interesting that he imagined these, you know, this race of beings that are sort sort of incorruptible ish, despite being made of an inherently they're, corrupt material. Like their material. souls can be deceived, they're, but they can't. Yeah. Be literally corrupt, like spiritually corrupted, (laughs) whatever that means. (laughs) And yet we have the whole question of, you know, what happened? Where did the orcs come from? The idea that they were corrupted elves, which is sort of like, you know, again, Mm -hmm. this comes this 50s, 60s era is Tolkien really doing a deep rethink on what Middle Earth is. Mm -hmm. And it gets it uh gets it's very interesting that he goes this route. It makes you wonder what the orcs are supposed to be. So um, in that in the light of that, if that was his thinking at the time, in particular, that's what he was going for. And again, you know, it's important to note to everyone. Nobody saw this. Nobody knew this was going on. You know, they they had Lord of the Rings the end. You know, mm-hmm. no one no one knew the Silmarillion during the course of Tolkien's lifetime. So it's like, you know, had they known, it would have been like, what the? You know, as it is, we're all like, what the? At this point, here? Mm-hmm. Just, mm-hmm. well, there's because there's also the there's the third option, which Jared, I feel like you were probably going to get there. But the third option for reincarnation is that the the Feya makes its own body again, which is even crazier to me it just because. Knows. How? <laughs> how does it do? That? It just does. Well, like, how can it create some? But, but also, why do? Why am I asking that at the same time? Like, why do I care? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's magic. I think. Who cares? Yeah, the division between soul and matter in this universe is so weird? Question mark? Because, like, there's a very long tradition in Christianity of. And I think this sort of ultimately comes from an intersection with Gnosticism, where mm. a person is a soul that happens to have a meat suit. Because matter is inherently evil, mm. soul is inherently good. Mm. But 
what happens here is a little bit a little bit like that but for him a person is naturally the union of the two it's not mm-hmm. like a, it's not like a pearl of spirit trapped in this disgusting material world it's soul has to permeate the world and if it's not you know mm-hmm. god isn't doing it somebody else is sending other souls to to permeate the world and Melkor just happens to have done it more successfully than anybody else. <laughs> but it's, I think that's really beautiful. Also much healthier than a lot of other things that were going on at the time where the, again, there were like matter is evil. The flesh is horrible. That's mm-hmm. uh, you're inherently bad. And that's it's a little bit of that, but it's also, it's, this is natural. It's just a natural process that's been broken slightly. There's some of that in the end glossary as well. The distinctions there between practices. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, no, a lot to unpack. Uh, there's 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 tons to unpack in this. There's we have, so much. We haven't even really touched on you know just some of the other things, and they're just sort of flipping through the generational schemes. The 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 yeah. Although that that I just <laughs> <laughs> and the explicit the explicit discussion in a couple of points, and some of this had been published in Vineyard Tengwar, but it might it's worth sort of teasing out about telepathy, almost mind control. Yeah. That part's oh, that, that's yeah. crazy. How you how you can't force someone to mm-hmm. reveal their thoughts to I you, think it was, right? The fra- that was yeah. What's the phrasing? I'd have to I almost have to dig this up again. There's no there's no axon, which is basically kind of like a law of the universe. Yeah, it was like you can't you read can't... their mind, but you can torment them to the point where they would tell you things telepathically. Right. Anyway, like right. Melkor can't just know your secrets, but he can. Scare you to the point yeah. where you will give them up. Right. Or, you know, get really good at reading body language, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, there's this uh, there's this sense of uh, there's this sense of, you know, Tolkien, you know, the, the, it, it's used almost as a shorthand in the more familiar public works, you know, about, you know, people being daunted. You know, that's kind of the mm-hmm. way it's sort of conveyed in uh, in the stories. Mm-hmm. Whereas here we get like in, in scraps and moments of deeper specifics about what that involves and uh, yeah this idea that uh, you know that if someone is feeling the impression of someone else's mind on them uh, Mm -hmm. it's sort of like how they react to it can be sort of confused or unusual and the interesting examples given are basically the perception of men dealing with elves which adds Mm -hmm. another real wrinkle to the idea that the elves aren't are supposed to be inherently Mm -hmm. good it's like well um, you know why this example what does it mean and what's going on there this sort of like Good but still dangerous kind of thing. Mm, mm, yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, it's famously there is in Lord of the Rings the one bit near the very end where our our elves and uh, Gandalf have a moment of tele- telepathic communication that just sort of mm-hmm. happens as they're sitting around at a campsite one day. You're sort of like, what's that all about? And then we get a little of this more right here, and it's sort of like, oh, that's a lot. Oh, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> you know, there's mm-hmm. just so much happening. And and then there's a bit about beards too. And then we got uh, all sorts of things. And then we got a pack that that apparently elven women aren't interested in crafts so much, apparently, which is sort of like, that's reductive guy. I think I missed that. I need to know what that, I need to see that part, because I think I overlooked that somehow, and it doesn't. Yeah, that doesn't it, seem right to me. But it, it, like, it isn't right. <laughs> I mean, it, like, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem to fit with the rest of his stuff. So that's why I'm kind of like, is that right? Is Maybe. that what's going on? What did yeah. I miss? It, was, it was kind of weird. It was sort of is. I mean, you get into the whole idea too of sort of like you know. I mean, we haven't there. This episode could go, seriously go on forever in terms of everything God, we're talking is, about here. I yeah. mean, we haven't even gotten into talking about like you know yeah. elvish life cycles, for lack of a better term, when <laughs> they marry, when they have kids, how eventually. Speaking of you know the difference between fan roar when the body fades away and it just is spirit just bobbing around going yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. and and marriage is so preoccupied with this problem <laughs> that he created for himself basically where he was like marriage is forever with elves forever until arda ends yeah. Darn it. And then was like, oh, whoopsie, I have this elf chieftain whose wife dies and he remarries. Really didn't think that one through. Uh, So we... And then he spent, like, decades figuring out how to make that okay and why it wasn't okay. Or maybe it was. And what happens when 
uh, an elf who has a spouse, dies, and then is, is gets a new body. You know, do are they obligated to... Are they married to the spouse still? Is that not okay? Because it's technically a different body. But no, it's the same. And it just goes... Like, it's, <laughs> it's, so it's a much. lot. It's a lot. Because at one point, at one point, he is like... that. Like, elves that die and get new bodies are the same person, but can't be with their former spouse because they're in a different body. And they can't be with a new spouse because they're already married. And then was like, wait, no. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Let's try something at different. At least you realize just, just what was going on. Get divorced. <laughs> just let people get divorced. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, right, my man. Oh man, it's, it's okay. It's okay. So, it's so, really so okay. So much going on. Why don't Why don't we? Uh, why don't we? Uh, you know, again, <laughs> we could get so lost in this, and there is much more to say. And for all we know, we may have further episodes tying stuff in here with other stuff throughout, which might actually be a good way to sort of really delve into some more of what's here uh, in terms of thinking things out. So we may return to that. Uh, let's talk about more about the last hundred pages of the book, because in some respects, it's almost sort of like having gone through all the all the meat of the stuff and all that. We get to because those last hundred pages, for the most part, those are fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's where we get. That's where we get all the random fun details, for the most part. You know, fun sometimes love about grim stuff. But the point is, we get a lot more about just these random details about life in Middle Earth. We get like the creation of Lembus. We get the founding of the Dwarf Road through Mirkwood. Yeah. Um, you know, these are small little moments, but they're great moments. It's like, okay, this is the type of stuff that you know. <laughs> I may not be a deep theologian. I apologize. Sorry, Tolkien, but I'm kind of enjoying this stuff a lot more in terms of that. There's the uh, the whole more details about the rivers of Gondor, and there's other stuff to touch on, but I think the thing that you're, I really frankly enjoyed the most, and I think we all did, was uh, stuff in Numenor, because we got a lot more about Numenor, um, and yeah. uh, that was really just fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, gosh, I mean, where to begin with that? Uh, should we just go ahead and talk about the bear dancing? Because the bear dancing was the amazing. Bears, the bears! The bear dancing. Who, who wants to talk about the bear dancing more? I want to talk about the bears. I love the bears. I love the bears. Go for it, Jared. <laughs> I don't care if anybody else wants to. It's my job. <laughs> that I love the bear I, stuff. I didn't mark it somehow, so I do have to find it. Give me a second. It, it's all good, but it it you know it it just the way it builds on a point, and then we get something amazing out of nowhere that has not been hinted at in any other Middle Earth writing. It's just astounding. So. Oh, yeah, 330, yeah, 330. 330. Um, there's this bit is of the land and beasts of Numenor, and it's talking about, like, it starts out being, like, you know, accurate charts were made of Numenor, but none of them survived, so we've just got memories to go on, and this is more of him being like, oh, well, we can't know for sure, and me going, okay, come on, it's your world. <laughs> you don't have to do this. Right. <laughs> um, and he starts talking about, like, the physical description of the land itself, which is, I think, really cool. Like, yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. Yeah, like describes the chief feature of Numenor being the cliffs, mm-hmm. because it's it's almost like the whole end had just been thrust up out of the sea, so it's mostly cliffs all the way around, which is mm-hmm. a great visual. And animals and things like that. There's birds and fishes and whatever. And then like right in the middle, there's this paragraph that's just like, oh, there were tons of bears there, and the bears were friendly, and the men liked the bears, and the, <laughs> there's no hostility between them, and all that, and. It's just these bears that the Numerians are buddies with. The bears, are, many of the bears, were quite tame. They never dwelt in or near the homes of men, but they would often visit them in the casual manner of one householder calling upon another. At such times, they were often offered honey to their delight. I love this. Um, yeah, there's a um, and then at the very yeah, and then at the very end, there's the, I read. I have to read a chunk here because I like all of it. Most strange of all were the bear dances. The bears, the black bears especially, had curious dances of their own, but these seemed to have become improved and elaborated by the instruction of men. At times, the bears would perform dances for the entertainment of their human friends. The most famous was the great bear dance, Ruxawale, of Tompole in the Foro Star, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> to which every year in autumn many would come from all parts of the island since it occurred not long before the Eruhantale, which I think is the the festival on top of the, One of the, festivals, the, the yes. metal dharma, mm-hmm. yeah, um, at which a great concourse was assembled. To those unaccustomed to the bears, the slow but dignified motions of the bears, sometimes as many as 50 or more together, appeared astonishing and comic, but it was understood by all admitted to the spectacle that there could be, that there should be no laugh, no open laughter. The laughter of men was a sound that the bears would not understand. It alarmed and angered them. And then we go to talk about squirrels. But, but just, just to have this... <laughs> 
Every year there's the bears. Yeah. Yeah. Just wonderful little moment. I mean, you think about things in Tolkien where he has, like, you know, obviously there's Bjorn and this whole, like, you know, mm-hmm. just sort of fusion, you could say, uh, that happens uh, in The Hobbit. And uh, I also think the Father Christmas letters. We've got, you know, the, the polar bear, a great polar bear and the nephews and all this. Yeah. This idea of bear human friendship, you know, just suddenly has this amazing emergence in Middle Earth out of nowhere, thanks to these mm-hmm. notes. I mean, it, it boggles the mind in the best way. <laughs> it's just, it's, yeah. it's, it's a wonderful new detail. It feels to me like it arises from the Finnish bear cult mm-hmm. that was there. Uh, but yeah, to- totally differently. I don't think the Finns were like having bear dances or anything like that. But no, I do. I swear to God, I, I read a story, some sort of fantasy thing, and I thought that it was the Chronicles of Narnia, where there was a group of bears that were dancing in a circle. And no, I think that just, well, I, mean, I made that up. In <laughs> like, Prince Caspian, there is a scene where a bunch of, yeah. including bears, a bunch of animals and people have this ring dance. Including but, bears. But it's not yes. just bears. Yes. So It isn't. I just totally, totally made that up. But there, it is this incredible visual that I really, <laughs> really hope the Amazon TV series writers are mm. at least now aware of. If they weren't aware of it before, that would be such a cool that I would love to write an episode the of television around the I Great Bear Dance. It's, it's inherently charming, I think. But I also love that, you know, Numenor is basically a utopia and Tolkien's utopia includes bear dancing. <laughs> These great black bears dancing. Yeah. yeah. And and speaking of utopias, I'm, I'm now suddenly reminded, I remember there were a couple of things uh, very near uh, the end of the book as presented, but of course, you know, again, this is just all collection of stuff. Uh, this is from the uh, Rivers and Beacon Hills of Gondor se- selection, mm-hmm. which again, very detailed, goes into um, we learn more about the geography of Gondor, why certain rivers and things were called that. It's some wonderful detail. It also goes into Halifarian and goes into more of the story about uh, basically building up to what became and what was shown in the uh, in the unfinished tales, as the uh, the meaning of Kirion and er- and Errol, and the foundation of the uh, the kingdom of Rohan, and a marvelous marvelous fragment of a story there talking about uh, going to what was Elendil's tomb, and basically he writes a section that leads up to that. He sort of comes up with one idea of it, and then he says, or it may have been a tomb, and then he develops that later. But this part is what's published here. There are two notes, however, that Tolkien himself wrote that are both like what that suddenly like you know completely like you know make you. Go about all these kind of things. Now, one of them is more about a key bit in Lord of the Rings, the book, not the film, talking about uh, you know the paths of the dead, and uh, and then talking about uh, talking about temples. And so here's the here's what this footnote is: the men of darkness built temples, some of great size, usually surrounded by dark trees, often in caverns, natural or delved, in the secret valleys of mountain regions, such as the dreadful halls and passages under the haunted mountain beyond the dark door, the gate of the dead in Dunharrow. The special horror of the closed door before which the skeleton of Baldor was found was probably due to the fact that the door was the entrance to an evil temple hall to which Baldor had come, probably without opposition to that point. But the door was shut in his face, and enemies that had followed him silently came up behind and broke his legs, and left him to die in the darkness, unable to find any way out. And that's just like, ah! Because in the book, you have, you have Aragorn and the party finding this body, and it's just sort of like, it's talked about how it was this heir of the throne of Rohan who just said, oh, well, Darren was never seen again, and it's clearly meant to be him. But now that we know more about what's going on there, it's sort of like, ugh, creepy. But then there's yeah. another section which is just mind-blowing in terms of one of the biggest questions that's always been asked about Middle-earth. Where's the religion? Where's the organized religion as a whole? And then you're reading along, and you're like, whoa, out of nowhere, this tiny little footnote says so much. So the idea here is that the text is said, uh, 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 talking about, uh, okay, so here we go. So from the main text, as Tolkien wrote it, the middlemen, descendants of the ancestors of the Numenorians, were not regarded as evil nor inevitable enemies of Gondor. Nothing is recorded of their religion or religious practices before they came in contact with the Numenorians. At that point, there's a footnote, then Tolkien separately adds this. Because such matters had little interest for the Gondorian chroniclers, of course it's the Gondorian chroniclers, as Jared notes, it's not it's not yeah. Tolkien himself, and also because it was assumed that they had in general remained faithful to the monotheism of the Dunedain, 
allies and pupils of the Eldar. Before the removal of most of the survivors of these three houses of men to Numenor, there is no mention of the reservation of a high place of worship for the one, and the ban on all temples built by hand, which was characteristic of the Numenorians until their rebellion, and which among the faithful, of whom Elendil was the leader after the downfall, and the loss of the mental Tarma became a ban on all places of worship. That's kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> That's a pretty, yeah. you know, this is this may be Tolkien suddenly thinking to himself in you know real terms, retconning, going like, I need to explain why there's nothing there. But even if it is that, it's kind of like, okay, whoa, <laughs> you know, that's, 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 these are the kind of like casual things that crop up throughout the book that are just like a sentence or two. And you're like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> holy crap. You just find yourself having to think about that a bit. I I like how chill the mm. religion in Middle Earth is, yeah. or kind of lack thereof. It's kind of nice. It's like no, no, you can like try and talk with Eru on a mountaintop or something. That's cool, but don't like <laughs> trouble yourself with building anything. No, no, Maybe no, there no, no. More of that. So um, we have definitely uh, chatted a lot. I have a couple of quick final thoughts or two, but uh, do any of you want to throw in last things about this book or what we're you know still digesting from it? There's still more to we'll talk about later for sure. But there there are a lot of um, really cool, interesting things uh, to sort of pour over in this, and you know, get it from your library or something. There are I, a couple. Um, one is brief. One is not. Um, <laughs> sorry, everybody. I thought the, the the brief one is I I liked the there's a a thing early on where he talks about the Valar didn't have language until the elves came along because they didn't need it because they just communicated mm-hmm. you know instantaneously telepathically whatever. So he talks about language only being the product of a soul and a body working together like that's the purest expression of that mm. is language. Uh, so that's cool. Yeah. That's fascinating. Philologist. Yeah. I like that. The other thing is, <laughs> Ned was probably going to bring this up, but whatever. I'm going to steal ahead, it. Do it. Do it. How much of the book is Tolkien going, you know, the Valar really screwed up. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's such a huge part of it. I'm just, we got so sidetracked talking about reincarnation, <laughs> but <laughs> You know, like the the Valar bring the elves to Amon when Eru had wanted them to stay in Middle Earth and be useful there, and mm-hmm. Eru let it happen because he's not going to override their choice and all that. But he's like, you know, you guys probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Amon is like, I just I was using my best judgment at the time. He's, it's, <laughs> Your instructions were very unclear, Dad. Um, I just. I like... <sighs> yeah, Eru roasts the Valar more than once. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah, and not in a... Not in, <sighs> I mean, you can still, I think, question Eru's conduct here. But there's a lot of stuff in there like the Valar really are trying to act in everybody's best interest. Mm-hmm. And they are screwing up consistently. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they also... Like, this is their job. They're trying to do their job to the best of their ability. And their best is not good enough, as it were. Mm. I don't. I, just, I really like that because I. I think if you only read the Silmarillion, I mean, only Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and the Silmarillion, you do come away with this picture of the Valar just not being great at their job, because the you know the mm-hmm. story is more interested in the elves, and that's fine. You know, we go to Middle Earth with the elves. We're not going to stick around in Valinor and listen in on what's happening. So, you, like, you, you think maybe, oh well, the world is not in the best hands here. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like that he he explores their point of view mm-hmm. co- pretty consistently mm-hmm. throughout here. Like they they are trying to keep the world safe. They they the the children of Eru or of Iluvatar have been given into their keeping, and so to them the obvious answer is like a baby, like a big sister or whatever, is like keep them indoors where they can't get hurt, like pull them into Valinor. Then yeah. nothing can, we, you know, we have to protect them. They're doing their best guys. They're just doing their best. They're just trying. <laughs> I feel so protective of them. It's just, it's just not enough. So, but, it's not uh, enough. but, yeah. but yeah, no, a very good point. Yeah. One to, one to bring up. And I think with that said, yeah, I'll just wrap this up. I will echo. It is, you know, this is, this is not for the casual reader. If you're just interested in a big sweeping story, <laughs> you're fine with Lord of the Rings. If you're, if you're the, if this is, this is definitely more the hardcore, eh, the mechanics behind it all. It is, you know, and again, fragmentary, just lots of footnotes, lots of things. 
lots of stuff where maybe just Tolkien throw down some thoughts and they weren't meant to be final thoughts. You know, we don't know about that. So that's the other thing, too. Uh, but it, it gives a lot to chew over. It'll be uh, interesting to see how this is more incorporated within further discussions as we go. Um, not just by us, by, by Tolkien scholarship in general. And as Oriana pointed out, whether or not anything in here gets adapted or used down the line in adaptations. We'll have to see. But uh, for now, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so now let's look ahead to the next episode. The choice of topic has come back around to Oriana. Oriana, what are we talking about next time? We're going to have a softball episode <laughs> right. next time. Bring it. It's gonna. We're going to talk about our favorite gardener, <gasps> Samwise Gamgee. We're just going to have a whole episode just talking about how much we love um, Sam. All right, all right. That sounds um, wonderful. Hero. You know, uh, adaptational choices mm-hmm. in in the various forms and the concept of Sam himself, and yeah, we'll go from there. That is wonderful. The 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 gardener who 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 was there to the end. So and mm-hmm. without whom. So uh, that is that is that is a great choice of topic. Um, it's been said more than once. He's you know the true hero of the story, and you know he has the literal last word. But we'll get into that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we will get into that. And you know that's not a softball. You know, although um, you know he might be a good softball coach. I could see him doing that in Middle Earth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what he did, you know. They, 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 if they didn't have soccer, they had something else. They had golf. We know that, thanks to the Hobbit. Say. So maybe he's a good golf coach. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, something to look forward to next time. As always, we thank you all very much for listening. Uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, our info is, of course, always in our uh, How to Contact Us and other things, always in our uh, outro there. We will also say one thing, a little tease. Uh, we will have a new modified logo soon. Uh, this is because our, our Lord and Master of Megaphonic. Chris has been doing some upgrades and changes. Not finalized yet, but we've seen some drafts. It'll look it'll look like the logo you're used to, but it will be different in kind of a cool way. So we're looking forward to uh, showcasing that sometime here in the near future. So keep an eye out for a Twitter feed and other things for that. That'll be fun. Um, other than that, that's about it. So thank you very much for listening. As always, we really appreciate it. We will talk to you next time. See ya. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarie. Namarie.